thanks, Samuel. Uh, really sorry I can't be with everybody in the beautiful city of Zurich for Biostasis 2021. Hopefully next year. But I'm not here to look ahead one year. I'm here to help us all consider what might be on the longer term horizon. So if people look at the top right there in the horizon, can we start to figure out what the state of the global cryonics community might be in 10 years' time? In that future, will we be celebrating strong success, more people signed up around the world, successful procedures? I have to say, based on the 10 sessions I've already seen of Biostasis 2021, I think there's a good probability we will be celebrating significant successes in 10 years' time. But there's also probabilities that our progress will stall and there will be as much disappointment in 2031 as you have heard some of the speakers express earlier in this year's conference. There's also a possibility that we'll be collectively in disarray and decay. Now, the point of looking ahead, of course, isn't just to imagine the futures, it's to figure out what we might need to do differently today to raise the chance that we won't have a future of disarray and decay and to increase the chance of strong progress. To change the metaphor slightly, to change the geography, here's the global cryonics community gathering around Biostasis 2021, busy, full of activities, as it were, on the ground floor of the sailing ship, fulfilling previous commitments. But I'm asking people to climb up with me, the mast, as a lookout, to put on our best horizon scanning glasses and to figure out what might be ahead that we need to consider now. Metaphorically, could there be rocks underneath the surface about to damage our progress? Metaphorically, could there be pirates of one sort or another ready to ravage our enterprise? In both cases, it's better to take timely, evasive action sooner. Probably more important than just looking for the dangers is looking for the possible upsides, the new winds or new currents that might get us faster to where we want to go if we tack in a different direction for a while and then move forward again. Or there could be new treasures of various sorts that we had not previously imagined. In both cases, it's a matter of adjusting our steering today. Okay, well, that's all metaphors. I want to move away from the metaphors. I want to ask you now, what would you put there in anticipation what are the elements of future scenarios that it would be wise to pay attention to? I'm going to offer in the next few minutes elements of five possible scenarios, and I'll briefly mention at the very end three more. Number one, the community might be engulfed by the fallout from scandals. There might be huge reputational damage that causes more infighting and schisms. Of course, we all hope that won't be the case, but let's be frank. Cryonics organizations are made up of humans, and it's almost inevitable that humans will from time to time have human nature, some personality conflicts. People will fall into love with each other and then out of love with each other. And I'm not just meaning in an intimate sense, I'm meaning in a sense of liking each other's business partnerships and then despairing at each other's business partnerships. That's what happens in the real world. And there will be people who take on more than they can actually accomplish and drop balls. There will be people who are promoted into roles which they cannot actually carry out. And there will be risks of organizations failing or a business is failing. After all, in the real world, most startups fail pretty quickly. And of those that don't fail pretty quickly, a significant proportion fail sooner or later. What's harder to predict, however, is the magnification of the inevitable local difficulties, possibly into very damaging global social media meltdowns. 
what extent might local incidents be fired into a global catastrophe? Well, we can prepare for such eventualities and we can try to manage them. And I think, based on what I've heard yesterday and this morning, the community is doing a pretty good job of this, a global sharing of best practices. Of course, there's some healthy, friendly competition, but there's a recognition that we are all in this together and we are stronger when we can share best advice on managing organizations, how to manage difficult but brilliant but difficult people, how to manage finances for long-term stability, how to structure things legally for longer-term protection, and of course, sharing advice on the latest and best technical and medical procedures. So there's global sharing. There's some discussion of global policing of dangerous practice, though that discussion doesn't seem to have moved that far yet, possible international crime standardization body. And there is the skill of PR, in which even bad news can be turned into good news if managed well, learning to manage the message. Scenario element two. Here's an artist impression of what could change our future dramatically, a research breakthrough that's going to make the world sit up and pay much more attention than at present. As a comparison, we do still hear of skeptics about AI who say, oh, AI is just overhyped. But from time to time, there are remarkable breakthroughs with AI, such as the recent news from DeepMind in London with their AlphaFold software that can anticipate in advance how three-dimensional proteins will fold based on a one-dimensional input of DNA base pairs. Remarkable, as was reported here, the most important achievement in AI ever. Everybody takes AI seriously, although of course there is still some discussion about hype in individual cases. Another example of research breakthroughs. There are fewer and fewer people who say aging can't be dealt with. There are more reports such as this in Nature recently, featuring research by Greg Fahey, featuring the report of the TRIM trial, that biological aging can be reversed. And let's look briefly at perhaps the biggest research breakthrough of all time in terms of changing the trajectory of the planet. Well, one of them at least. You probably can't see this. This is too small. This is a newspaper interview with Lord Kelvin, possibly one of the most famous physicists in the world. In 1902, he had traveled to America by ship and the journalist wanted to ask him, what's the chance that in the future you would come not on a boat, but in an airship guided across the Atlantic Ocean? And Lord Kelvin said, not possible at all. No motive power can drive a balloon through the air. No balloon, no airplane will ever be practically successful. The journalist went on. Are you sure there's no hope of solving the problem of aerial navigation in any way? And Lord Kelvin, who might be compared to the Michio Kaku of his time perhaps, said, I don't think there's any hope. Neither the balloon, nor the airplane, nor the gliding machine will be a practical success. In reality, Lord Kelvin was a much more eminent physicist in his day than Michio Kaku, the well-known cryonics skeptic he is today. Lord Kelvin, after all, had the temperature scale named after him, and he laid the foundations for the entire science of thermodynamics. He was no fool. But just one year later, there were starts of some reports of something remarkable happening in America, and the biggest breakthrough actually came a few years later. What you're seeing here on the right is film of Wilbur Wright flying outside Paris at Le Mans, in 1908, and you're seeing on the left a large crowd of French dignitaries watching in some astonishment. There was a delay of five years between the initial research breakthrough and the Wright brothers feeling confident that they had all the commercial arrangements and patents in place, and when that happened, Wilbur took to the air and flew in figures of eight, and his brother did similar demonstrations in America. Before that breakthrough, people had 
often died through reckless flying experiments. As we heard, there were long arguments that navigation would be impossible and other technical arguments that said if you did manage to get off the ground, you could not manage to land. But after the Wright Brothers demos, well, one of the people in the crowd, Louis Blériot, was really inspired and within 12 months he had flown all the way across the English Channel. Within 10 years, two others, John Alcock and Arthur Brown, had flown the Atlantic nonstop. And within just five short decades, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had flown to the moon. Now, I'm a futurist. You might expect a chart like this in my slides, a Ray Kurzweil sort of curve, exponential progress. Things start slowly. They, for a while, don't keep up with expectations. When people see the possibilities of a new technology, there is excitement, platform hype, you can call it. But in reality, at first it's hard, and at first there are disappointments. And after the disappointments, there are still the technology enthusiasts who say, hang on in there, it's coming soon. And there can be layers and layers of disappointments. AI winters, they might be called. Significant new funding is required before there is the, oh my God, breakthrough. The Wilbur Wright flying in 1908, some of the deep mind, remarkable results, and so forth. And so it is sometimes said by futurists that disappointment first leads in due course to disruptive breakthroughs. And this has happened for AI, and it is increasingly happening for longevity biotech. But what about biostasis technology? What's the trajectory of research breakthroughs there? Now, you might draw it differently. I'm going to draw it something like this. Yes, there are interesting breakthroughs. There's work done by Greg Fahey again, by Brian Welk. Interesting research recently by Natasha Bittemore showing that a C. elegans that is deanimated and then reanimated remembers things from before. There are the very interesting results being reported by Roman Bauer and by Raman Risco, but I don't think we're making much progress. And there are two theories as to why this progress has been slow. The first theory, which is popular in most parts of the world, says the reason there are no significant research breakthroughs is that the field is intrinsically too difficult. Michio Kaku, although he gets the details wrong, might be right in principle. Now, those of us who are here don't buy that viewpoint. We see there's no evidence that the field is impossible. We say instead it's just hard, and the field has been slowed down by insufficient funding. After all, this is different from AI and different from longevity medicine. In each of these cases, there's prospects for very significant profits to be made. That's why large amounts of funds are being applied by private entities. The country that gets AI right will probably rule the world. The country that gets chronics right, well, I don't think they'll be ruling the world. So there's insufficient funding. And we should mention also the E word, the E word. It's an embarrassing field for many people to work in. It's sometimes described as a career limiting field. Deep learning used to be a career limiting field. Rejuvenation biotech used to be a career limiting field, but there were enough initial results that it broke through. But today I think it's still the same. So what are our options to do things differently? The one option is that we have more people like Brad Armstrong, rich benefactors who, as Max reported in his talk yesterday, has donated billions of US dollars to set up something that's called the HAL Research Cryonics Research, HAL Finney Cryonics Research Fund. So that's possible, and I'll have more to say about it shortly. Another idea is there could be significant commercial rewards in Kalanix, which might lead to significant funding. I'll say more about that in a minute. And that would diminish this fear that there'll be no profits to be made. And there might be new types of partnership. So let's move on then to scenario element three, the prospects of commercial cryonics, which is different from today's cryonics, which is basically 
cryonics at break even. In this scenario, there would be very significant profits to be made. There might even be people going into cryonics with the view of becoming a millionaire. And this might be a distasteful thought, but please bear with it for a few minutes. The idea is that some patients would pay more, a lot more money, if there was a higher probability of successful biostasis and eventual reanimation. And that prospect of significant profits might lead some companies to do sustained research, private corporations into better biostasis. So how do we evaluate this prospect? And some of you will say, no, thank you, yuck. It's going to increase allegations of scams. We're all used to people saying Cryonix is just a get-rich-quick scheme for a few people. That's relatively easy to dispense with today. We just point people at the public audited financial figures of Cryonix organizations. But if people were trying to make money, it could bring a bad taste to this whole field. Although we might manage to police it. We might manage to set up good standards. People will say it might make Cryonix more objectionable morally if only the really rich could afford it. And there might be an answer that, well, it will be very expensive to start off with, but as with many other industries, the price will come down. People will object that this prospect for significant commercial profits would only depend on keeping research secret or patented, and not everybody likes that. Well, my assessment here is that this isn't that a credible a scenario. It would likely depend on long-term patient investment. It takes a long time to convert basic research into a viable product. Few commercial companies would show sufficient interest. The only companies that might show an interest probably would be the ones that we don't want in this field. So it's better to consider some alternative scenarios. So let's look at scenario four which I call productive partnership. And we've heard a bit about this already in some previous talks. The idea is that Cryonix doesn't get enough funding in its own, but it can benefit from research undertaken by another field, which has greater momentum, greater social respectability, such as the Organ Preservation Alliance. There is a great deal of support for the idea that more people can benefit more quickly from organs donated by others who die in tragic accidents. And if we can cryopreserve organs better, more people benefit, and then Krylix can benefit. This is not, of course, a new idea. I look back five years to a youthful young Pedro de Magalhães giving a talk at London Futurists on this very topic. He talked about the Organ Preservation Alliance and those in the audience liked it. Excellent discussion and lively debate was one comment. And I think one of the attendees today uh, online gave this comment five years ago. There's a lot of interesting things to say here. Interestingly, as with all the times that one the futurists organize a climax event, there are a small number of attendees, although there have been more people watching the recording online over the years. So my assessment of this, will such a partnership cover the most important experiments, which are the ones that could cause the world to wake up and pay attention, evidence of recoverability of a biostated brain, reanimation of small organisms larger than C. elegans worms, going down to sufficiently low temperatures? It's unclear whether any partnerships will do that for us. And it's also unclear whether people in that larger field will like that relationship. There will be, here's that E word again, a sense of embarrassment. So what can we do? Well, of course, we should keep working these connections. There are good prospects. Let's keep an open, proactive mind to explore these piggyback possibilities. But we also need it to deal with this ongoing fear of embarrassment that many people have to be associated with this fear field. We need to strengthen the intrinsic case for cryonics. And that brings me to the fifth element. I've talked about scandals, I've talked about research breakthrough, I've talked about commercial cryonics and productive partnership. 
I'm now going to go way out on a limb and suggest not a research breakthrough, but as some of you might guess if you recognize this person, a philosophical breakthrough. This is a famous portrait of Immanuel Kant, the great German Enlightenment philosopher. And what I'm playing with, and maybe humor me for a moment or two, is the idea that there could be a more compelling analysis of why preparing for biostasis is a profoundly good moral action, which we should expect and help each other to do. Now, how might this work? Well, let's give an analogy. Let's compare an argument that we already know and we think has already been won. You get some people, actually lots of people, who basically are afraid to say they would like to live significantly longer than the average, even though they might sneakingly want to do that, because they think that would be selfish or it would appear to be selfish. And the large worldwide anti-aging community is quick with an answer. We say, it's not a selfish thing. We want everybody to benefit. Everybody should be living significantly longer. And that is a restatement of Kant's categorical imperative, that you shouldn't wish for something unless you can make it part of a universal principle. And the longevity community is confident. It has won this argument that it is moral to invest resources in achieving the goal of the longevity escape philosophy, because of the longevity dividend argument. It's a strong economic rationale. Instead of paying lots of money to look after people as they are old and infirm, we can pay a shorter amount of money in the short term to benefit. And the goal is viewed as increasingly credible. We should do it and can do it. But, but many people in the anti-aging community don't like to go the next step. And they are afraid in an analogous way. They say it is selfish or it would appear to be selfish to tie up large financial resources in the very slight chance of one day being reanimated after cryo preservation. And that's the argument we need to dispel. The utilitarian calculus doesn't seem to be much in favor of spending that money in that way. Let's look briefly at that utilitarian calculus, full body biostasis, upwards of $200,000 with Alcor. Now you can compare that with the cost of heart bypass surgery or heart transplant surgery, which on the face of things is much larger, but there's a documented 75% chance that somebody who has that operation will live at least five years, whereas there's no such documentation of a probability of a successful reanimation, and most people would put the probability quite a lot lower than 75%. And the calculus gets worse. That $200,000 has to be kept somewhere safe. It can't be invested in anything speculative. It needs to be ready, whereas the $1.4 million gets recycled within the economy. That money could have been passed instead to family members or to other clearly philanthropic purposes. So the utilitarian calculus is against cryonics, which is why people are often embarrassed to get involved. But there's a lot more to morality than a narrow utilitarian calculus. After all, you could say, let's pick on one person who is healthy. Let's kill that person. Let's take their healthy organs and give them to five people who are about to die unless they get these organ transplants from a narrow utilitarian calculus, that is a good thing to do. But we all say, no, there's more to morality than that. Life should be paramount. So here's the possible scenario that this person, me, their argument will be countered by a strong assertion of cryonics morality. It's not immoral to want to live. Life is vital. Life is paramount. Our own life and the life of our loved ones. And by the way, we are seeking this not just for ourselves, but for everyone. There's the categorical imperative there too. And in the past, people's lives were often seen as of lesser importance. There was in most of history the view that in the Latin phrase, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, 
It is sweet and honorable to die for your country. People were expected to die in battles for kings, for religious causes, for ideology. We in the modern age say, no, life is paramount. And that's what we can assert. And we can assert also that the costs will come down as the scale of the community grows. The pioneers will make it easier for the people who come afterwards. Well, I'm almost finished. I've talked through five scenario elements. If I had more time, I would look at scenarios in which celebrity endorsements, possibly motivated by the kind of argument I've just given, would transform the public perception. This is not somebody who says it might be a nice idea, but who publicly signs up. We could look at how this world of chronics might be transformed by more people in China leading the way. And there's a lot more to be said about another whole scenario, which is the growing popularity, not of this uh, cryo, uh, cryo preservation, but of kennel preservation with plastination popularity, which could, in the end, be seen as something that is much cheaper, although a different set of philosophical assumptions get engaged. Well, that's my offering as a futurist, but also as a capitalist. I don't know the answers to many of these questions, but I'm hoping that the community will be able to provide answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, questions from the audience up here? Hi, David. It's uh, Sergei from Ukraine. I have a question about standards such as the internet, the mobile phone community, which I was part of for 25 years, made progress by standardizing GSM, Bluetooth, 3G and 4G, and by sharing a lot of knowledge while still remaining competitive. The motto could be collaborate before competing, with a strong sense that we are truly stronger together. And I'm pleased to see this conference now, in several years it's been running, which is a great forum for sharing of these insights. And I know there are lots of other contacts going on. So let's keep on emphasizing, of course, the benefits of individual competition, but subordinated to a bigger vision that we are in this for everybody in the world together. some of the answers last night in this panel session with the uh, online Discord community. That community is reaching out and there are large proportions of people in that community who would call themselves cryo-curious and they're from all sectors of society. We heard a few minutes ago from Jose Cordero getting his message out on a, a large 
major audience uh, channels, such as the History Channel and the Discovery Channel. So outreach is continuing, and we need to keep experimenting. Max Moore does a wonderful job in different ways of explaining why this is a sensible and moral point of view. Let's keep learning which arguments work. Let's keep figuring out what are the remaining blockages. And people often don't honestly express what's holding them up or holding them back, they may often rationalize it without honestly explaining it. As for what the crimes community is doing more generally to breach the isolation barrier, I think that's a question for other members of the community as a whole. I'm a friendly outsider rather than an insider, and I think that's a question for the lunch and subsequent discussions. Right there, there's a couple more questions from John and Chris. And the first one means, I think there's a strong academic case for economics. It can and have to be aggressive, defensive, and to grant balance of quality, different quality, and uh, life years. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that argument can be developed, yes. Now, there are probably objections to that because the view is, well, we were killing people early instead of giving them a few more years of life, uh, perhaps, that they would have benefited from. But uh, I think that deserves uh, exploration as well. So I, I like the, the idea. Let's uh, find as many strong moral arguments in favor of this as possible. Right, the next one means, are you yourself signed up uh, or will you sign up in the next 10 years? Well, I certainly hope to be signed up within 10 years' time. I hope to be signed up a lot shorter. I have to look inside my own heart. What is the reason for my lack of pressing the button? I'm still not entirely sure. I guess uh, the money thing does put me off. That I have money assigned to various uh, tasks just now, and uh, part of me thinks it would be selfish and naive to uh, uh, ring fetch it in such a way. So that argument is still playing out in my own mind, but I certainly hope to uh, make my arrangements uh, within the next year or so. And I'm really sorry I couldn't be this year in Zurich where such uh, discussions might have progressed even faster. Right. That seems to be a popular question, so I'm skipping on the ones that I kind of alluded to the same topic. Um, so the next one would be, I'm 50% through a good draft of book making the moral and neuroscientific philosophical, uh, philosophical case for universal crime preservation. Do you know any literary agents for books like that? Again, I would echo that question back to the community as a whole. My own experience in publishing has been not very good in, in that I have tried to interest various publishers in my books from time to time and they have not uh, been so interested and therefore I have published my books by myself, which gives me more freedom to say what I like, but less uh, I'll buy. So I'm sorry I don't have a good answer to that. On the other hand, please speak to Jose Cordero because Jose has great connections with uh, quite a few publishers around the world, as we saw. Good. And last question is regarding uh, philosophical views. I would last like to ask your views uh, about evolution, psychology regarding death in general population, how to address that. So I'm not quite sure if that's talking about the psychological aspects of the, the denial of death, as uh, talked about by the famous book by Ernst Becker, The Denial of Death, and then magnified into the theory of terror management theory, TMT, by various researchers, that uh, hangs over much of our philosophizing. It perverts our ability to think clearly because it's such a terrifying concept and that prevents us from seeing things clearly. And it needs a careful approach to dislodge that terror and help us to think things more clearly. So I'm not sure if that was the thrust of the argument, or it might be, does evolution depend upon death? And I will say absolutely no, our evolution does not depend upon death. There were creatures that have immortal lifespans, and we humans can now take charge of our own evolution. It will not be evolution by blind natural selection anymore, nature ran into the claw, instead it will be evolution by intelligent design, a transhumanist vision in which we not only live much longer, but we can carve out whole new possibilities for ourselves. All right. Um, thank you, David. Um, actually, I'll pick up another question here. Um, it says that a good price claim to achieve immortality, um, contrary to scientific findings of the matter of the universe, of our universe, will one day be taken we could, we, we could talk about the word immortality for half an hour. I disagree that 
Earth, there is a scientific finding that uh, we can't be immortal. There is the transcension hypothesis by John Smart that people should look up. Even if this universe decays, we might be able to create or tunnel into another universe by ourselves in the future. So, but I, I think the argument isn't about immortality particularly. The argument is about extra long years of healthy life. And there will be constant issues about new threats to us in the future, which we can then look with our new technology of the future to address at that time. All right, before we move on, one more. Uh, can also convince to be used as an argument against transportation? It certainly is used as an argument, and it's, there are good answers to it. There is plenty of space on the planet for many more people. We just need to reform agriculture, especially the agriculture which grows so much plants in order to feed to animals so that we can slaughter the animals and kill them. Once we take advantage of improvements in synthetic biology, we can have beautiful tasting cultivated meat grown in huge laboratories. We can get back large parts of the planet and we can then live in more environmentally sustainable ways. Uh, there's another 20 minutes I can go on about this, but I think it's time to pass on the microphone to the next speaker. Read some of my books about that subject, The Abolition of Aging, for example.